Hey, you guys, in today's video, we're going to be discussing various solutions that you can deploy to naturally resolve your PMS, uh, also known as dysmenorrhea. It's really interesting because I think every one of us, ever since we were young girls, was told that PMS is being part of being a girl, right? Um, that's just that's just what happens. And you are, it's normal that you're going to be on painkillers and having a terrible time and skipping school and maybe lying down in a fetal position on the floor and you're just going to rough it out. And what I have learned over the years that um, all of that is unnecessary. You are definitely going to be, we're going to be feeling a difference, right? And, you know, if you think about when you see like a menstrual cycle of a woman, how we have all the ups and flows throughout the cycle, it's normal that is going to be, you know, you are bound, we are bound to be feeling um, at times, like during the time of ovulation, for example, this is a time it's very normal that we feel a great sense of openness and um, we feel sexy, we are extroverted. Um, it's no surprise that servers earn the highest amount of tips when we are ovulating, women, right? And so it, it manifests and that's normal and it's okay. And it's also okay to be experiencing times of introversion and, um, and feeling a little bit, you know, um, wanting to be by yourself and not necessarily be uh, the center of the party and wanting to be retrospective and, um, you know, and just going home and having a cup of tea in front of a fireplace and, and, a, and a good TV show and that's it. And that's, that's okay too. And that's what many of us that can happen, uh, for example, before our periods or during our periods when all our hormones are at the, at the absolute lowest. With that comes different dietary needs, um, different exercise needs, right? And that's normal. But what is not normal is to be in a fetal position, having to have painkillers on both sides of your bed and skipping school and skipping uh, work, right? Just because we are just completely debilitated and that's not okay. And that's my story for sure. You know, ever since I was, um, I got my period when I was 15 and, um, and I remember being, you know, not being able to go to school on the first day of my period. And my parents knew that I wasn't skipping school because I didn't like school. I actually liked school because I was, I was a good student. And, and so that wasn't the issue. I just wasn't able to. And the same thing carried forward to being at work and taking, having, working and taking the first day off from work. So I'm sure many of you can relate here to this story. And the importance of, I think, of those PMSs and, as well as PMDD is, um, is to you know, learn to regulate them so much so that you have, you experience the changes in your body, but it's not debilitating. And as you do that, and you go into perimenopause, you're going to then end menopause, you will sail through those rather than be having to go through a storm. Okay. And that is my wish for you. Um, I think most of our community here are, you know, um, you guys are like, we typically attract the 45 to 65 um, community. And what I have seen is the heavier periods of women, or not just heaviest, but the, the, the more terrible your PMSs have been as a young person, the harder time you're going to be having going through perimenopause and then going into menopause, you know, with all that, um, with all the urban myths and, and jokes and, uh, that, that surround menopause, right, and the forgetfulness and the mood swings and that all of that, um, all of that can get a lot better when you learn to regulate your hormones, starting off with your PMS. Um, so I'm going to do a chapter reading. I'm reading from chapter 15. That's right here. Um, this is, of course, in conjunction with my new book that's just come out called Overcoming Estrogen Dominance. It's a book that's now available. Um, we are, well, worldwide. Um, but you, uh, we suggest that you order it on overcomingestrogendominance.com. I think you're going to like, we have a little gift for you there. It's a gift cart. So when you go and buy the book, come back to this website, enter your receipt number, and we will send you uh, the gift cart code. So if you have been missing some of the events, we are posting all the replays of the different videos we've been doing every day during the launch party um, on our website, Overcoming estrogendominance.com slash events, okay? So today is chapter 15, uh, dysmenorrhea and PMS. I'm also wondering how many of you here are experiencing heavy periods because that's a, a chapter that's, that follows. And if there's um, a good number of you who are 
experiencing it, then I'm going to read that too. Now, one thing you want to do is pay attention um, or at least somewhat because we, we do, we're going to do a book giveaway today on this call. And the book is going to go to someone who gets the answer right to my question. And the question is going to be, I'm going to ask this question based on what I'm reading here. So uh, that way, um, you know, you, you learn something. So, so let's get started. This menorrhea, period, period pain, and PMS are not a given with every woman. That's right. Your period can be an, an uneventful occurrence. Our culture has led us to believe that menstrual periods are unbearable and miserable, a time to be dreaded. Getting a period means canceling appointments and getting fun activities on hold, right? Wrong. Your period can be a gentle event with most of the day passing without you affording it too much thought. Key facts. Dysmenorrhea is the medical term for pain occurrence just before menstruation marked by severe and frequent cramps. There are two types. Primary, pain caused by cramping related to your period as your uterine muscles work to push menstrual blood out. Secondary is pain caused by another condition impacting the reproducting organs such as endometriosis, fibroids, or pelvic inflammatory disease, also known as PID. Premenstrual syndrome um, PMS refers to dozens of potential symptoms impacting a woman's physical and emotional health in the five to 10 days leading to her period. PMS can affect 80% of women to various degrees and about five to 10% say it is debilitating. Symptoms, pain, lower back and lower abdomen, anxiety, depression, tension and feeling edgy, irritability and anger, mood swings, insomnia, suicidal thoughts, low esteem and, and self-doubt, higher sensitivity to adversity, feeling overwhelmed, vomiting, craving carbs or comfort foods and sugar, weight gain through water retention. Severe menstrual pain that compromises your daily life may include secondary dysmenorrhea or an infection. In this case, it's time to speak to your gynecologist or healthcare provider. Symptoms to look out for include at least three painful periods, passing blood clots, cramping accompanied by diarrhea and nausea, pelvic pain when not menstruating, infection, fever, sudden and severe pelvic pain, foul smelling vaginal discharge. Diagnosis. Pelvic, pe pelvic exam is the first step to determine if secondary dysmenorrhea, an underlying medical condition affecting your reproductive pelvic organ is causing you pain. They may also order, they may also order um, these diagnosing diagnostic tools or tests rather, ultrasound, CT scan, MRI, um, laparoctomy. Causes, estrogen dominance, especially high estrogen, particularly estradiol as compared to progesterone, low progesterone. Stress, in order to make enough cortisol to support the body's stress response, pregnenolone is diverted or stolen away from progesterone production to make cortisol. When this happens, you're producing so much cortisol to deal with a stressful situation that you have insufficient progesterone to balance out estrogen. High TSH, also known as thyroid stimulating hormone, or low thyroid function, hypothyroidism, um, also Hashimoto's. High testosterone, inflammation caused by diet, food intolerances, alcohol, stress, or toxins, among many other sources that feed inflammation, synthetic hormones such as estrogen and, progestin, and progestins, High caffeine consumption, not a cause by certainly will make cramps and PMS worse. Traditional treatments. For primary dysmenorrhea, you have painkillers, of course, antidepressants for mood swings associated with PMS, birth control pills, synthetic estrogen, progesterone hormone replacement therapy, hysterectomy in rare, very severe cases. For secondary dysmenorrhea, treatment options will depend on the underlying cause of your pain. The most common first-line treatments for period pains doesn't, don't address the root causes, including estrogen dominance and inflammation. Synthetic hormone replacement therapy can cause a range of serious side effects. That's why I recommend trying natural options. So this section here now talks about what is the protocol for that. Step one, do the 28 day, step one is do the 28 day estrogen reset foundation protocol, including the foundational supplements. See part four for everything you need to do successfully. After doing the foundation protocol, you may not even need to implement step two. 
But if you feel like you've mastered it and need to go deeper to address your period pain and PMS, read on. Remember to see your doctor if you have any of the symptoms of secondary dysmenorrhea or suspect infection, endometriosis, fibroids, PID, or other underlying medical conditions in a source, as the source of your pain. Step two, implement the dysmenorrhea and PMS protocol. Implement as much of the following as you can. Some things may help and others wouldn't. Everyone is different and will we'll respond to changes in varied ways. Try seat rotation. Now, who here has tried seat rotation? Let us know. Seat rotation is the technique to balance estrogen and progesterone levels throughout the month by boosting estrogen levels in the first part of your cycle and progesterone levels in the second part. Rebalancing your cycle using the simple food-based technique can help alleviate period pain and PMS in a little as one or two months. You will incorporate one of the following two seat combinations into your diet and then switch alternating seat combinations. Add these seats to salads, smoothies, or a glass of water. Now, seat combination number one is to boost estrogen. You do one tablespoon of freshly ground flax seed. Do not use pre-ground flax meal. It has little potency. And one tablespoon of freshly ground pumpkin seeds. Seed combination number two is to boost progesterone. And you use one tablespoon of ground sesame seeds and one tablespoon of freshly ground sunflower seeds. What seeds to use when? In the follicular phase of your period, which is day one to day 13, it depends on a person, sometimes it's day 14, add the seed combination number one to boost estrogen. In a luteal phase, which is day 14 to day 28, add seed combination number two to boost progesterone. Try essential oils in a PMS salve. And by the way, I was showing the PMS salve this morning how to make it, and I modified it for you just to give you something a little bit extra beyond the book by adding magnesium, um, a liquid magnesium to it. I formulated the PMS salve, CPH 350 for the recipe that acts as an anti-inflammatory painkiller and relaxer to the uterus. By using castor oil, you will benefit from deep penetration of the self. I personally use it each time I get this mineral out and find 70% of the pain eases within 30 minutes. Add topical progesterone. If you haven't already started using topical progesterone as part of the foundation protocol, now is the time. I have found that applying progesterone topically is an absolutely wonderful solution for cramps and PMS. It also improves sleep, promotes a, um, improves sleep, promotes a calmer, um, it boosts your mood, it raises your libido, regulates your cycle for, for more predictable periods, builds bones, converts fat to energy, and lowers your risk of developing estrogenic breast cancer. Lower inflammation. Inflammation is a primary driver of cramps and PMS. An anti-inflammatory diet and supplements that target inflammation, such as those containing curcumin, can help a great deal. Add borage oil internally, a potent anti-inflammatory and pain reliever. Borage contains 20 to 26% gamma linoleic acid, also known as GLA, a fatty acid that converts into prostaglandin PGE1 and PGE3, natural painkillers, and suppresses PGE2, which is the inflammatory um, one that causes pain. The recommended dosage is 240 milligrams three to four times per day with meals or as directed by your healthcare practitioner. Try castor oil packs to support liver detoxification to clear out dirty estrogens and reduce inflammation. If you haven't already tried castor oil packs, now is a good time to begin. For more of, on their benefits and how to apply a pack, see page 150. Use a compress large enough to cover your uterus and liver and be sure to apply it um, seven days before your period starts. You can add the PMS salve on page 350 to your castor oil packs for more support. Implement herbal strategies. Work with a local herbalist to create an herbal formula that combines several different strategies, hormone modulators, liver support, analgesics to relieve pain, as well as adaptogens and nervine to promote calm and resolve your stress. These herbs support the following strategies. So you have a few herbs here listed, hormone modulators. We have chaseberry, also known as Vitex, donkwai, ginger, and black cohosh. 
And I showed you this morning how to make a latte using this herbs, Supp uh, liver support. We have dandelion root, burdock root, analgesics. We have creme bark, cord uh, corridalis, and kava kava. Adaptogens and nervines, especially if you have a lot of stress, will be ashwagandha, schizandra, my absolute favorite, rhodiola, urethro, skullcap, milk oats, and, milky oats, and passion flower. And then I talk about taking Dutch test and taking saliva testing. And so that's um, something you, you know, we talked about it with Dr. Sean just, um, just before this video on how to, um, on, how, on, on all about Dutch testing. So I'm not going to refer to that. But one of the things that you'll see in Dutch testing is women who are highly estrogen dominant also have a lot of uh, symptoms of PMS. So, yeah, so as you can see, you know, there's so many things that we can do. Um, so I'm going to quiz you. And uh, before I forget, so the, the book giveaway is going um, to a person who can answer my question. And the question is, what are the seeds to help you boost in luteal phase your progesterone levels? What are the two seeds that you need in the luteal phase to increase your progesterone levels? And there's two seeds that I'm looking for. So um, my team is going to select a winner. Whoever gets the two seats right will get a copy of my latest book, Overcoming Estrogen Dominance. Are we having um, a lot of folks here having um, uh, pumpkin and flax is not correct. Uh, that's for estrogen. Um, and, um, and I'm wondering, do we have a lot of folks with heavy periods here? So one of the, um, okay, so Christine is saying yes, okay. Um, so I'm going to, um, you know, what I'm going to do, what I'd like to do on uh, with heavy periods is to uh, just share with you that actually a lot of the strategies are very similar to what I've already covered um, with the PMS. Uh, the And so the... You know, I'm just, just as I look at the strategies, it's like seed rotation, which is exactly what I mentioned just now. We have that atopical progesterone, so it's the same thing. Um, the, the difference is going to be implementing herbal strategies. So I'm going to jump into this section here because that, that's the one that is distinctly different. Work with a local herbalist to create an herbal formula that combines several different strategies. Now, the big one here is going to be astringents. Astringents is to minimize blood supply to the uterus and uterine tonics, hormone modulators, and adaptogens or nervines. These herbs support the following strategies. And it's really important when you, you know, one of my favorite ways of, um, of working with a really smart herbalist is to address the various elements of your body to really the contribute towards healthy periods, right, or heavy periods. And it's not just like one thing most of the time. If a person is having, for example, if you're having sluggish liver, then incorporating some herbs into the formula that are liver supporting. If you're massively stressed out, incorporating some nervines and adaptogens will be a really smart thing to do, right? So um, it isn't just one thing. So with heavy periods, it's um, the all-encompassing strategy would be astringents and uterine tonics. And those are the ones, like I said, they were going to restrict blood flow to the uterus. They're pretty amazing. Um, and they, the, the, one of the most powerful ones is yarrow. Yarrow is a white flower that you've seen on many walks before. If you, um, if you Google it right now, what, what yarrow looks like, because pay attention on, uh, to it when you are going on walks. You can easily harvest that and dry it and, or make tea from it right away. Witch hazel leaf, stone root, shepherd's purse herb. Shepherd's purse, actually, let me show you the picture of shepherd's purse. You, you might have seen, it's like one of the distinct things about it is that it's got leaves like a little, little hearts here right? And so again, like if you pay attention, uh, it's a total weed. If you pay attention, you would have walked past, past uh, Shepherd's Purse like multiple times. Um, partridge berry herb and cypress tip are all um, astringents. I want to give you a quick, um, quick story just to demonstrate how incredibly powerful they can be in terms of stopping blood flow. Uh, I've never had heavy periods per se, but I experienced something else where I cut myself. So last year over summer, I went on this botanical camp um, deep inside Colorado. 
and we were doing some exercises, um, you know, some some work exercises, and we're doing some infusions and distillations and stuff like that by a river. And all of us were clipping herbs, and I basically I wasn't paying attention. I had this very sharp um, a, a, a scissors, and I was talking to someone. I wasn't paying attention, and I and I chopped off the tip of my my thumb. And so you know, we were in the middle of nowhere, right? And nobody remembered to bring a first aid kit. Because like, why would you, you know, how would you hurt yourself unless you're a Magdalena? So, and, um, and boy, I mean, that was pretty overwhelming. Um, I mean, I, I was literally like blood just, just kind of go, Pow! and um, I was covered in blood and um, I started feeling pretty weak. So immediately, I mean, one thing I do know is to press on it and lift up my, my hand above my heart, right? So that you stop the, the blood flow. But of course, the minute you bring it down, everything just pops out again. So one of the instructors immediately went and found yarrow, uh, got me to chew on it. So I chewed it up to make it into a poultice with my saliva and then immediately put it on the tip of my finger, right? And gently press on it. Then she took a leaf and a vine and she, she, you know, she bandaged it around. And, um, and it was basically, it was like a makeshift, you know, bandage until we got back to the camp. And, um, and I will tell you that within... 15 to 20 minutes, not only did my bleeding completely stop, but it also, um, the other benefit of the Yarrow has is that it is also a painkiller, a natural painkiller. And so the pain, like 70 to 8% of my pain, and mind you, that thing was painful because it was a deep, deep wound. And it took like a good two weeks to really heal up. Uh, the pain was almost completely gone. So 78% of the pain was gone. Of course, if I, you know, if I was trying to put some pressure on it or, or do something with my hand or lift it, put it down, it, it will, I could feel the pulsation of, of the blood coming back. But, and then the, the other thing is I decided I was not going to do any traditional and, um, you know, um, antibacterial creams, which I did have, but I thought, you know, I'm just going to give it a try and see for 24 hours and, and let me just see what, what it does. And I never developed any infection whatsoever. Um, I only used that. And then later I ended up some plantain, not the banana plantain, as the plantain, again, that's like a super common weed that you see around. And just that combination, especially yarrow, I used yarrow for the first two days, stopped bleeding, was, was antibacterial and, um, and, and a painkiller all at the same time. I mean, what an appreciation I, and what a love I developed for yarrow as a plant at that point for something so you know personal and pretty traumatic i will say i almost fainted because it was just so much blood uh, there was a girl who was very sensitive to blood and she fainted by the river um so the whole thing was just like a little bit of a commotion and uh but you know from now from reflection it's like wow this is um there was a you know great experience just to just to really feel the the power of herbs and so yarrow you know that's how powerful of an astringent it can be uh, to restrict blood flow so the same way when you have too much of blood flow in your uterus, um, that can really um, help. And then we have, um, um, so moving on to the next uh, section, which is hormone modulators. You have hormone modulators, a really wonderful one is Chaseberry Vitex. It's gonna increase your progesterone levels and that's really great also for heavy periods. Donkwai and ginger are known for that. The next ones will be adaptogens and nervines, especially when you have a lot of stress. And those will be, again, the same thing, ashwagandha, Shizandra, rhodiola, urethra, skullcap, milky oats, and passion flower. Okay. So um, let's see what um, Alexander is saying. I'm curious. Talsi was not listed as an adaptogen. It is not recommended for PM for PMS. No, it is. Um, in fact, I think our we do use it in, in a lot of different um, things. So yeah, it's it's um it's a mild adaptogen. It's not like in the really strong categories of of adaptogens. If you look at the literature on Telsi, um, it is not like one of the top ones, but it's, it's a definitely a lovely tea. I, I absolutely uh, love and recommend. Where do you buy your seeds um, so they are not grown in China? Uh, what seeds are you referring to? Not sure what seeds are. Okay. So let's get the clarification on what the seeds, what the seed question is. And um, yeah, so one of the questions I have for you is how, what are you guys learning from, um, from these, from these videos? And um, 
And what are you? Pumpkin? Oh, pumpkin, right, pumpkin seeds, okay. Um, uh, I didn't really, you know, I mean, what I'm looking for is, I, I get it from my co-op, um, my health food store that sells organic pumpkins, and that's what's important to me. I don't know where they're grown, to be perfectly honest with you. I think, you know, to some degree, I mean, managing, I mean, looking at the source of every single food, it will be pretty difficult. I do trust that, especially if you're re re buying from a reliable health food store, um, like in Colorado, I do shop oftentimes at um, um, natural grocers and they are really diligent about sourcing food. Um, so, you know, I think they do a lot of work and checking. And I would want to trust that if they're buying something organic, even if it's from China, it's from it's clean enough for us to um, to be eating it. I thought Don Kwai was contraindicated with heavy menstrual flows. Um, actually, it's not. It's uh, that's a really interesting um, question because Don Kwai, also known as Angelica sinensis, is one of those herbs that I would consider that actually um, like I I always like to call it, you know. Uh, a, a, a um, estrogenic adaptogen it kind of depending on what you need it works in that way and so you're right that like for example it can help with menopausal symptoms a lot of the time but if you look at the profile and the studies on dog quiet it actually helps with heavy menstruation and regulation of pmss as well so it's uh i and that's one of the you know amazing things about herbs it's kind of depending on what you need it kind of acts that way right and so yeah, so Don Kwai is definitely on the list here, as Svetlana is asking. I want to just tell you about another herb on, um, and we were, um, so by the way, the, the person who was, who was behind the scenes, who was doing all the banners at the bottom of the video, her name is Brittany, and Brittany and I went to school, the same class actually together. And um, I don't know, Brittany, if you remember, there was a nature walk we went on, and during our um, sort of hands-on botanical walks, and one of the herbs that and they asked us to um, well to experiment on and just we were we were discussing is was motherwort, and um, and we were and the motherwort she's she's nodding her head yeah so motherwort is uh, is another beautiful herb and is um, is a beautiful herb that can actually help women the opposite side of the spectrum and that's women who um, do not have a period and want to bring on a period right and so. So what happened was, we, as we were on a walk, I thought, you know, I just collected a few extra leaves. I brought it back home and I infused it. I made a tea just like what I'm drinking here right now. And I put maybe like three or four big leaves of motherwort to a, to a glass of water. And in terms of my cycle, I was in the middle of my cycle. So I was just probably right after ovulation. And my cycles are regular as much as like they are getting shorter now in my luteal phase because I am headed for perimenopause and my cycles now are like more like three weeks with luteal phase being only one week long. And um, so I was right after ovulation. And so I was still a few days away from my period. And like I said, I'm regular and my period was not expected. And just from having that tea on my, of my word, um, I immediately got my period the, say, the, the following morning. And so that's how powerful an herb can be. On the other hand, there was another girl who was struggling with um, who was struggling with um, with anxiety, and she had an anxiety attack right there during the class. So much so when she was lying on the ground, her heart started palpitating so much so that her shirt was like bouncing off her chest, and she had a really bad episode. And so she took mother warts and uh, she chewed on it, and like literally within ten minutes, her entire um, anxiety attack went away. So. It's uh, it's quite an amazing, um, amazing one. Uh, Brittany, was it you who posted this? Uh, Mother word, yeah, it's also helpful. Uh, helped me with cramping as well. Okay, so that's another, um, another benefit. As you can see, you know, a lot of times um, in uh, I think in Western culture we we like to pigeonhole an herb. Like like this morning I was showing you St. John's wort, right? This beautiful yellow flower. Again, that's another um, pretty invasive flower, actually. And uh, the blooms, you know, throughout summer, and and we always, you know, we it's one of the most most often contraindicated herb to be taken, especially with SSRI, so antidepressants, and um, and so we we kind of pigeonhole St. John's wort as being the antidepressant uh, herb, and it truly can be, can really m lift up your mood and and make you know and just bring a lot of brightness and lightness to your life. 
But it's also, it can be also applied in other ways. And I was showing it this morning in our PMS self, how to um, use a St. John's wort infused in oil, because you don't want you, you don't want to use it straight into the formula. It has to be infused in oil first. And um, and what a wonderful anti-inflammatory it is uh, for the uterus. It's also acting, is really great for calming down any inflamed skin, like eczema, psoriasis, if there is a you know, some rash that just won't go away. St. John's wort is absolutely wonderful for that, right? So uh, these herbs are a very multi, uh, very diverse. Uh, is it Dar Darcy? No, Dacri. Um, you're providing answers to concerns and questions I didn't realize I had absolutely priceless information. Thank you. Awesome. So um, yeah, so before we wrap up for today and um, and go into the weekend, I wanted to ask you, what are the things you're going to be implementing in your own life from all the things you have learned? Or maybe if you've already gotten the book, Overcoming Estrogen Dominance, you, you got the book and you're reading it or you're planning to read it. Um, what, are you, um, what are you planning to implement from there? I'm just curious. Because, you know, it's one of the most rewarding things to someone like me is, um, you know, when you put so much work into writing this book, it's not the work that, it's not, it's not the work that really, um, it's not producing the book that really gives me the biggest joy and satisfaction. The biggest, the biggest joy for me comes from hearing your stories, reading your stories of transformation and sharing with us saying, you know, um, I did ABC and, and, um, and like my period came back or I got pregnant or my fibroids shrank or my uterine polyps shrank. Um, you know, it's, um, that's really what my wish for you is. And, and I hope you find the relief of your symptoms and freedom and I don't know, like, you know, just like real mastery of your own health and understanding that this is not just about your hormones, but it's just everything you, you're going to change is going to improve the overall quality of your life, not just your hormones, but everything else. Um, what is the title of the book? The title of the book is Overcoming Estrogen Dominance. You can get it on overcomingestrogendominance.com or it's also available on Amazon now. Uh, so Corey is saying, um, Corey is saying um, she's going to learn how to formulate and start drinking more herbal teas. Yay. Awesome. Um, the tea I'm drinking today is, by the way, you know, one of the things I really love about these sort of mugs, uh, these sort of uh, jugs or, or, or uh, what do you call those? Um, long day today. So, you know, whatever, um, is that you can put a little candle down below here. And then once you infuse it, you know, the candle keeps it warm. So like you have like even a stronger, uh, infusion is going on. And typically I'll finish, this is about two quarts of tea and it's a pretty strong infusion. And I'll drink that throughout the day and I kind of vary it around. But one of my constants in my teas is red clover, uh, because it's it gives me a slight boost of estrogen. And um, I'm at the point right now, but I'm feeling my estrogen is beginning to drop a little bit. So I'm, I'm bringing it up with drinking things like the red clover tea. Yesterday, I was also, um, oh, I also had red raspberry leaf um, in, in here as well, which is also high, is slightly estrogenic. Yesterday, I also added a little bit of uh, teapot. That's right. Uh, where can you purchase this teapot? You know, I got this one actually on um, on Amazon. And they have some really nice ones, beautiful ones. So just enter your teapot. Um, and this one came separately. I bought it as a separate a separate item. Adina is saying, I can wait to get a, a, I can wait to get the book and start. I think you meant, I hope you meant you can't wait <laughs> and start reading it. Uh, how soon after pregnancy can I implement the protocols in the book? So Adina, I will say the one area I don't specialize in is pregnancy and postpartum and women who are um, lactating or or breastfeeding that's just not my expertise area and it really is an expertise area so you know you might want to talk to your midwife um or your obgyn just to see you know when is especially when you're breastfeeding it's also um like for example one of the things that to be really careful with is if you're doing any form of detoxification uh, then to be really careful because it will go through out to the milk and and then it can impact the baby. So there's a lot of things to consider. Um, but I think a functional, functionally oriented herbalist who specializes in that or a midwife might be a really good go-to person to um, uh, to ask. 
All right. Hey, everybody. I'm looking forward to the weekend, and um, we, I'm taking a break tomorrow, and uh, then we're going to be back on Monday with more videos for you. There's going to be a really cool stuff coming up. You can see all of that at overcomingestrogendominance.com slash events. And we're going to be talking a lot more about fibroids. We're going to be talking about hot flashes next week. We're going to be talking about everyday products um, that may be causing estrogen dominance, like cleaning products, skincare products, what to look out for. Um, and so a lot of really great content. Um, but also this content is, is in the book too. So um, if you don't want to watch the videos, then just get the book too. All right. Well, thanks everybody. And I will see you next week.